Good morning. Uh, we're moving on. Again, another day, another chapter. Um, we're going to be looking at oscillatory motion. So oscillatory motion uh, involves something oscillating back and forth. Uh, for the example here at the beginning of the chapter, they've got this spring inside a, uh, an automobile, uh, a, a suspension system, so that you know spring can oscillate back and forth. Um, Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at this. We'll look at the basics first. So this actually looks kind of complicated um, mechanical system to start out with. Uh, here's our list of topics. There's a lot of stuff in Chapter 14. Let's go ahead and get started. So uh, what we're going to first of all look at is let's look at a spring. And so we'll have a mass attached to it. So it is a lot like that uh, first picture that we looked at. So the idea here is let's take, to start with, a frictionless surface. Let's go back, and we've done this before. Let's imagine a surface with no friction at all. And so this block uh, just slides freely back and forth. Now, there's going to be a gravitational force, there's going to be a normal force, but those are in the vertical directions. And so as far as any motion, horizontal motion, along this surface, the only force involved with that would be the force of the spring. So the idea is this. First of all, we can attach the spring and we'll pick a point right there and call that the center of the object. And we'll call the equilibrium location x equals zero. So it turns out that's a useful way to set up our coordinate systems is to have the very center point be x equals zero. Then what happens is, let's say that we pull the object back in this direction and then let go. Now, if we pull the object, or if it oscillates on its own, to this direction, there's going to be a force uh, back towards the equilibrium location. So x, then, will be measured as displacements from equilibrium. At x equals 0, the object's right at equilibrium. Anything other than 0 means that it's been displaced in one direction or the other. So if we set this up, we pull it back and we let go, and this begins oscillating back and forth, the force is coming from the spring, and the force will always be in the opposite direction compared with the displacement. If the displacement is to the right, the force is to the left. If the displacement then later is on the left, the force is back to the right. So we've got these two examples of displacements. In this one, the spring is being stretched out. In this one, the spring is being compressed. Uh, what we refer to this force as being is a restoring force. It's a force that tends to bring the object back to equilibrium. Now, even though the force is back towards equilibrium, what that force results in is an acceleration. Remember, we imagined a, a frictionless surface. So instead of staying at the equilibrium point, it overshoots. Um, so that gives us an oscillating system. So, you know, you, you guys have seen springs on things that, that oscillate back and forth, and that's the example that we're going to start off with in the chapter, uh, developing some of these ideas, some of the vocabulary that we need to talk about oscillatory motion. Now, it says here that we're assuming the surface is frictionless. We don't have to do that. We can come back and put some friction in. We could easily have a setup where there is still friction going on here, but the object can, uh, will still oscillate back and forth. Now, if there is friction, then whatever energy of motion the object has will so slowly be dissipated, or, or quickly be dissip dissipated. So, uh, but for, the, for, for now, so when they say, um, we assume the surface is frictionless, I just wanted to point out that uh, for now we're going to start off that way, but later on we're going to put some friction back in. Um, there's a point where the spring is at its natural length. That's the equilibrium location, and we're going to be measuring x from that point, either to the left or to the right. Now, what they've done is they've explicitly put in the negative sign here. So they're saying that the restoring force is minus kx. And, and that characterizes a restoring force, something where the force will be in the opposite direction 
compared with x. So that's really what the minus sign is telling us. It's not like it's a minus force. It's just in the opposite direction of the displacement. Mathematically, if the x is a positive number, f will be a negative value. Uh, if we're representing x as a negative value, then f will be positive. So x and f will, will be in opposite directions. That's, that's how we're keeping track of the um, directions. Um, and there it is. The minus sign indicates a, it's a restoring force. It's directed oppositely to the displacement. Now, k is the spring constant. So we've seen this. We've looked at springs back when we were doing work and energy calculations and potential energy and said that there's a certain amount of energy uh, stored in a compressed spring or a spring that's been stretched out, either way. Um, and so what we have now is, uh, well, we have this formula, the restoring force formula. We're using the K. Now, you're going to ask, well, are there other systems other than springs? And we're going to find out that there's other types of oscillatory systems that don't involve springs. But all the oscillatory systems involve a restoring force. And we're able to set up uh, a formula like this for all of our oscillating systems, whether they're springs or not. So little k becomes uh, more general, uh, more generally a force constant. Um, so what we're going to do to describe the motion here, uh, first of all, we're going to point out the force is not constant. Uh, you know, we're back in chapters three and four and five, uh, we had objects with constant acceleration very frequently, constant forces and constant accelerations. This time we're not going to have either. Uh, the uh, force is not constant, and that means that the acceleration will not be constant either. But we'll still have A is equal to F over M at each instant of the motion. So we're coming back to you know, our standard formula, uh, Newton's laws of motion, uh, and, and making that connection between acceleration and, and force. All right, so let's follow this. Now, uh, since this thing is oscillating back and forth, what we can do is break it down into a series of steps, and they've picked out five steps that are kind of useful. They're saying here we are at maximum compression. Right now, the velocity, just momentarily, just for an instant, the object has slowed down and stopped. It's getting ready to go back in the other direction. So right at this instant, there's no velocity here. All of the energy of the system is stored in the spring. And we're at a dis, uh, displacement of minus A. So A stands for amplitude. We talked about displacement. That's X. Amplitude represents the maximum displacement. If it's an ideal spring with just one constant K describing how it behaves, then we'll end up going to uh, between a negative, well, well, we'll end up going in amplitude to the left and an amplitude to the right, and those two amplitudes will match. And mathematically, we're going to represent those as positive amplitude and negative amplitude, or positive something and negative something, uh, with the equilibrium right in the middle. Now, when we move to the next step, this thing has accelerated. There's our force. It's picked up speed. It's accelerated in this direction. And at this point, right as it crosses equilibrium, that's where its speed is going to be the very highest. Uh, you guys know this, I think, from swinging in a swing set or something, right? If I'm in a swing going back and forth, I'm going the very fastest at the bottom, and that's where the equilibrium point is. So uh, again, the force has created an acceleration, and that acceleration has boosted the speed up to some value. And right here, all the energy is kinetic. None of the energy is stored in the spring anymore. The spring is back at its, um, its, its, its unstretched length. So the spring's back being uh, completely unstretched. Uh, let's see. Now, we oscillate over to amplitude in the other direction. That's the, most, that's the largest displacement. And again, momentarily stop. So once it crosses equilibrium, the force now is in the other direction, right? As long as it's on this side, on the left side of equilibrium, the forces are acting to the right. 
And the force is not constant, so the force is the very largest when the spring is stretched the most. And here, the uh, force has gone to zero. There we go. The force is zero here. Uh, here, the force is the very largest in the opposite direction. Um, and then here, the force has gone back to zero. So you can see that it cycles. So it cycles back and forth. Now, we started with no friction at all with the idea of, well, if we don't have any friction, then uh, what, will, what will likely happen is this thing will oscillate forever, right? It's just going to go back and forth. Uh, the forces in this direction are going to create enough speed so that when it passes equilibrium, it will slow down in the reverse direction, but it will slow down at the same rates that it was picking up speed. The amplitudes are going to be the same on either side. Now we can talk about this also in terms of energy, and we'll, we'll do that a little ways into the chapter here. Um, so in terms of energy, we would say there's uh, potential energy and kinetic energy of this oscillating system. And if there's no friction, if there's no air resistance, uh, if there are none of these resistive forces taking place, then what will happen is uh, all of the mechanical energy will be stored in the object and the spring and it'll just oscillate forever, right? Which is an idealization, of course. Uh, all right, what about vertical springs? You know, I see things that are oscillating vertically with springs. Maybe we could set up a spring uh, in a vertical direction and attach something to it. How do we identify equilibrium? How do we identify displacements? So uh, here's our first picture. We just hung the spring. And then in the next picture, we're going to attach an object with mass. We're assuming that mass of the spring is negligible. Uh, we attach something. What that does is it provides us a different equilibrium uh, point. So depending on how much mass this has, it's going to stretch, stretch out the spring differently. Now this time at equilibrium, it's not the force of the spring that's zero. It's the net force, the net vertical force is going to be zero. So the way this works is, and, and what they're saying here is, it doesn't make a difference. It turns out that the oscillations are going to behave um, the same way. All the, thing that we talk, all the things we talked about with amplitude um, and speeds and accelerations, they still all apply. But they're now all going to be relative to a different equilibrium position. The equilibrium position will be at the location uh, we're going to call this distance that the spring is stretched already at equilibrium. It's stretched by x naught. Uh, the force kx naught and mg will balance out at equilibrium. So equilibrium, you, know, you can think of that equilibrium point as it's not oscillating yet. We put up the spring, we added the mass on, we carefully brought it to equilibrium and let go, and then we had some measurements to make sure we've got the equilibrium location um, correctly identified uh, in the problem. So again, I, I drew my own version of this. Uh, so here is the spring by itself. And I think these multiple uh, diagrams are useful to think of kind of the, the time progression of what's going on here. So I got out a spring. I attached it. I attached a mass to it. I very carefully lowered the spring. And what that did was it stretched the spring out by x naught. Now the spring at this point, as far as the mass is concerned, the mass has two forces acting on it, one from the spring. The force from the spring will have a magnitude of k times x naught, and it's going to be in the vertical direction. So what you're noticing here is we talked about the force being minus kx. Um, you have to be able to set up these diagrams and decide when is a negative sign need to be there in my formulas or when do I not need it. And typically in the diagrams, we, we don't need to include it. Uh, the diagrams, the directions are already being kept track of with these arrows. Mg is in the downwards direction. Kx naught is in the upward direction. So you kind of put the minus signs in as needed when you're carrying out uh, the algebra, deriving formulas. And then when it's not needed, you, so it, it takes a little, you know, practice seeing how that's, uh, how to deal with that. Now, at the equilibrium, we're going to get some important information, and that is that kx naught, the amount the spring has been stretched, 
is equal to mg. And that tells us, oh yeah, the spring will already be stretched by an amount mg divided by k. Depends on how much mass there is, the gravitational field, and how stiff the spring is. Now, uh, once we set it into motion, once we have this thing oscillating back and forth, let's bring it, so, so here was where the spring was originally. Putting the mass on, bringing it to equilibrium, added on x naught. Now, since this is our equilibrium, this is what we're going to define as x equals zero. So, um, that says that the spring now is stretched by an amount x naught plus x. So, this force upward is now k times x naught plus x. This is the distance it stretched to reach equilibrium. This is the additional stretch if the object continues to, to, if it drops below the equilibrium point. Now, if it's above the equilibrium point, then that x value would have a minus sign to it. Now, for the diagram that we have set up right now, what we want to do is say the net force being provided by the spring and gravity together would be given by k x naught plus x <coughs> minus mg. And when we factor out the kx naught, uh, we see that the kx naught and the kx, the minus mg cancels the kx naught and the net force is kx. So uh, that's, that's what they were saying is that if we hang this thing vertically, there's a, there's a, a gravitational force we have to deal with. But that gravitational force is going to match the effect of the spring uh, at the e already in place at the equilibrium. Those two items cancel, and now the x is, <clears throat> it's not really the distance the spring is stretched. It's how much additional stretch the spring has. Uh, and this has been derived in terms of magnitude, so we're just keeping track of there's a net force uh, given by kx. So uh, we would need to <clears throat> um, be clear about which directions we're talking about that force is in. So if x is in the positive direction here, this force that we've calculated would be um, in a negative direction. All right. All right, here's a car spring. Whoa, we really are. First example is the car spring. It says this. It says that uh, we've got an automobile, a uh, family of four, uh, mass of 200 kilograms. Step into a car. Now, the car is already 1,200 kilograms. And uh, when the family steps in, it compresses an additional three centimeters. Now, the car is already sitting on top of the springs. So... Um, Let's see what happens. They want us to figure out what the k value is for the um, suspension system of the car. So let's just reduce it to one spring. You know, instead of having four separate springs, one happening at each, each wheel or each tire, let's just uh, switch over and say that it's, it's kind of like one spring uh, is, and, and the suspension system of, of all of those springs combined, we're going to say is like k. So I'll say f is equal to kx. Um, <clears throat> here is the natural length of the suspension system. Assuming we take the weight of the car off. We took the car off, all the springs are stretched out. Now we're going to set the car onto those springs. And it looks like this. So here's the car sitting on the springs. And so the springs now are compressed. Same as before, there's going to be some distance. Uh, I'm going to call that x1 this time. So um, the car's on there. Uh, it could go into oscillation, the car itself. Now, instead, what's going to happen is we're going to have uh, four people uh, get inside the car. And what that's like doing is taking the spring and placing an additional mass, uh, M2, stacking that uh, on top of the uh, spring. And so now what I've got is I've got a gravitational force of M1 plus M2 times G and I'm going to write that as k times x2. So x1 and x2 are keeping track of how much has the spring compressed. So, and, and this doesn't go into oscillations. They don't, uh, at least not in this example yet. And so what we're doing, trying to do is just find equilibrium uh, compressions of the spring. And uh, so here was the formula describing what happened
when we set the car on top of the suspension system, on top of the springs, and then when the four people got inside, now it's compressed an additional amount, and uh, the gravitational force here balancing that is M1 plus M2. Now, uh, did I write down the M1 and M2? Uh, the M1 was 1,200 kilograms. I don't see it. Uh, yeah, I don't see it. Okay. So the M1 was 1,200 kilograms. That was the car itself. And then the four people getting inside, that was 200 kilograms. And so what we can do then is say that we can take these two equations from diagram one, diagram two, and I'm going to subtract the first one from the second one. So this is being subtracted from here. <clears throat> that will give me on the left side kx2 minus x1. On the right side, the m1g cancels out. So it's just differences between the uh, compression distance of the spring. And so k times x2 minus x1 is equal to m2 times g. Uh, now, they told us that x2 minus x1 is 3 centimeters. And that's why we did all of this. Uh, they didn't tell us how much the car compresses when, um, well, they didn't tell us how much the springs compress when the car is set on top of the springs. You know, you buy the car, the car's already sitting on top of the springs. You don't take the car body off from the suspension. So what we're able to do here is by seeing how much additional compression there is on the spring, three centimeters, we're able to go in and determine K. So it turns out K we can get by uh, determining how much additional gravitational force will there be and dividing that through by the additional compression. So that's 200 kilograms in Earth's gravitational field and uh, the compression 0 0.030 meters. Now the K value, and we expect this is going to be pretty large, uh, for this automobile, 65,300 newtons per meter. Uh, now the, uh, you know, the, what came up in my calculator was 65,333, and then I rounded that back to uh, 65.3 kilonewtons per meter of compression. So that's the K value uh, that we're going to work with. Now I went back and, and let, put these numbers back in my calculator and, and then uh, went in and asked, let's look at the compression in steps. So it says that the amount that the spring compresses then would be uh, the force, uh, you know, how much force is being used to compress the spring. And the force at this point is gravity. So it's going to depend on what the gravitational force is uh, acting on this. So again, what I've got is uh, I'm going to have a kx force in this direction, I'm going to have an mg in that direction. So uh, at different equilibrium points, and again, nothing is oscillating in this one. We're just uh, playing around with the equilibrium points. So uh, adding in 1,200 kilograms gives us a compression at equilibrium of 18 centimeters. Uh, and then when we had the 200 kilograms, the, the four people get in, um, that compressed it to 21 centimeters. Now I can calculate x now because we determined what the k value was. So once we've got the k value figured out, uh, then we can use this formula to determine how much compression is taking place. And there's the three centimeters, right? So it went from already being compressed at 18 to being compressed by 21, and that was an addition of three centimeters. Now they say we're going to add an extra, an extra 100 kilograms. Is this somebody else climbing in the car? It's loaded with 300 kilograms. So an extra 100 kilograms from somewhere. You know, maybe it's somebody else gets in, a couple people get in, or maybe put a bunch of luggage on top. Uh, 100 kilograms is a lot, but... Um, so an extra 100 kilograms would compress it an additional 1.5. So we can see, uh, as long as... The spring remains ideal. Now, at some point, you compress the spring so much, it, it can't remain ideal. It's, it's compressed against itself. Uh, but this spring, uh, over these distances, we're going to treat as uh, maintaining the same spring constant. All right. Now we're ready for oscillations.
we play around with some of that equilibrium stuff. This is any vibrating system, any oscillating system, where the restoring force is proportional. That's a key word. We could highlight that uh, to uh, the displacement, but in the opposite direction. So again, when they say negative of, that means the opposite direction of. So whenever we've got a restoring force uh, that's proportional to the displacement, it, it, we, uh, we end up with what's called simple harmonic motion. Now the last thing you need, this is a fairly challenging chapter, I think. This is one of the harder chapters in the course. Why are they calling it simple? Don't do that. Just call it harmonic motion, right? We don't have to say it's simple harmonic motion, but that's, that's officially what it's called. And that's a big deal, not just in physics, but all through engineering. So um, anyway, uh, you don't have to, you can ignore the simple if you want, or you can put it in if you want. Uh, simple harmonic motion, uh, and the system is called a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, what we can do then is we can take this force. Now, they've written this as kx, which is kind of funny. Here, I think they need the minus sign. Um, they're ending up with this equation. Now, this is what's called a differential equation, and maybe some of you have taken differential equations already. Some of you are looking forward to taking differential equations. We'll see where this comes back, uh, comes from. So, this is the equation we're going to be working from for simple harmonic motion. And this is what the solutions look like. So, for us right now, well, both, both, we're, we're interested in both. We'll, we'll see this on the next slide. But this solution right here uh, is maybe what we're mostly interested in. It turns out that we can represent this oscillation as a sine or a cosine function. Now, not all oscillations are going to exactly follow a sine or a cosine function. But whenever we have this example of where, you know, let me see what we got on the next slide here. Whenever we've got an example where the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement, that leads to solutions that behave like a cosine or a sine function. That's kind of interesting. So, uh, sines and cosines, you guys have, you guys have been working with sines and cosines your whole lives, right? It, it feels like, probably. And so, uh, sines and cosines, when you were first introduced to them back in a trigonometry class or something, you were thinking, oh, these are kind of interesting functions. I wonder if we'll ever use these. And we do. So, the sines and cosines get used all over the place. Whenever we have oscillations, uh, sines and cosines are our go-to functions. So, uh, and so this is kind of, uh, what we do is we take all the oscillations and we uh, decide which ones exactly follow the formulas for simple harmonic motion, and then the ones that don't, we find some way to maybe approximate them as if it's simple harmonic motion. Anyway, the acceleration is equal to force over mass. That's just Newton's laws of motion. And what we're going to do is take this force expression. Now, I need the minus sign in here to make sure that f and x are representing opposite directions. And so I substitute that in for f. What I'm left with is minus k over m times x. Here's the k. Here's the x from that formula. So k and m are constants. Now, this becomes really important in these formulas. What are the constants? What are the functions? Now, the functions here are x as a function of time. Now, notice it's just being written as x here, but that x represents some sort of a mathematical function. x is not constant. And similarly, the acceleration will not be constant. Once this thing is oscillating back and forth, x will vary with time, and a will vary with time. So k and m, those are the constants. Uh, x of t, a of t, those are the functions. Now, acceleration is the second time derivative of x. x is a function. If I take that function and I take a derivative, I get velocity. I take another time derivative, I get acceleration. So the acceleration gets replaced with second time derivative with, um, of, of x. Uh, now, on the other side, what I have is I've got the minus sign here. I've got the k over m. And then I have a function on that side, too. And that's what makes it a differential equation. Differential equations have a function in the equation somewhere. And then they have uh, some number of derivatives of that function 
also in the equation. And so what we're saying is the second time derivative of the x function is equal to some constants times that function. Now, do you guys know of any functions where if we take two derivatives, we get the same function back again, but this time it's got a minus sign out front. And you go, yeah, those are cosines and sines. So here is our guess. So when we look at that differential equation, we go, hmm, we stop, we stare at it, we think about it. We go, you know, I wonder if a sine or a cosine would work. It's oscillatory motion. Let's try a cosine or sine. So we try that. Let's use a cosine, for example. Now, what I'm going to do is put in cosine omega t. Now, in math, we could just write down cosine of t. But in physics, t has units. So uh, t has units, you know, very likely seconds. And so I can't put t by itself. I have to put in a frequency. So we've seen this before. We've seen this with uh, circular motion. Uh, we worked with sines and cosines of uh, omega t. Anyway, we're going to go back and kind of review that. Uh, but let's try this as our function. Now, if I take one time derivative, that should give me the velocity as a function of time. And notice that the displacement and the velocity are out of phase with each other. When the displacement is at its maximum, the velocity is zero. We saw that on that first uh, slide. With, uh, so, so this, in fact, it's almost worth going back and taking a look there. So when x is maximum, v is zero, but the acceleration will be maximum. Uh, similarly, when x is zero, the velocity will be a maximum, but the acceleration will be zero. Now, the cosine and sine functions automatically keep track of all that for us. So the, uh, the displacement function is going to be a cosine omega t. We decided to try that, see if it would work. We took one derivative to get velocity. That came out as negative omega a. And then the uh, acceleration came out as negative omega squared times a cosine omega t. Now, if you notice, the x function here and the acceleration function look very, very similar. The only thing different between them is there's a minus sign and there's a factor of omega squared. So two factors of the frequency of oscillation. Um, and so what we can say then is that the acceleration is, uh, which is dx, second derivative of x with respect to t, is equal to omega squared times x. Now that's what we wrote here. So what we've got now are two formulas with a and with x, and we set up all the differentials and, uh, and took all those derivatives. Uh, what that's telling us is that k over m is going to be equal to omega squared. And so what that does is it tells us what's the frequency of the oscillations. Omega is going to give us an angular frequency. It's going to tell us at what rate we are oscillating through these cycles. So uh, again, going back to this diagram, uh, amplitude was the maximum displacement. Here is displacement. That's, that's the x function. A cycle is going all the way through and back. So all the way through and back constitutes one cycle. And those cycles are now going to be represented by cosine or sine functions. The period is the amount of time it takes to complete one cycle. The frequency is the number of cycles something will oscillate through uh, per time unit, per second in this case. So that's what we've got. What we've done is we've identified, yes, if the force can be represented by a, a simple formula where k is our force constant, and it remains constant, then the solutions to the oscillation are cosine or sine functions. If you go back and try this with a sine, that's going to work too. So it could be written as purely cosine, it could be written as purely sine, uh, or it could be written as a combination, what we call a linear combination. Now you'll notice what they did 
uh, they didn't use just a cosine. They introduced a phase angle, and that's another way to write these solutions. So by adding an additional phase constant, there's a certain phase constant that's been added, it, it shifts the cosine or the sine function. It generalizes them. We'll see examples of where that shows up. Okay, so now we know what's going to determine the frequency of this oscillating system. And it says that the frequency is going to depend on how stiff the spring is. If the spring is stiffer, it's going to oscillate faster. Right? If k goes up, omega goes up, and omega is a frequency. It's telling us how rapid the oscillations are. If I add more mass to the system, that slows things down. More mass is more inertia. That's going to slow down this process. All right, and we did that by solving this uh, differential equation. So there we go. There is omega squared equal to k over m. Uh, there are constants, uh, the amplitude, which have not been determined by the spring and the mass itself. The amplitude is, is, uh, it is not set to be just one value. The amplitude will de be determined by how far we pull the system back and then let go. Or if it's a car going down the street, you know, how big is that bump that the car hits? If it's a big bump, then you're going to get a lot of amplitude of oscillation uh, in that system. Uh, and the phase constant, uh, the phase constant uh, tells us that where we are at t equals zero. So let's take a look at this function they've got. Here is the period. So this is a useful diagram too. Here is represent. This is our time axis. They've got this thing oscillating back and forth. Here is this ideal spring with a mass attached, and it has a marker. And what they're doing is they're scrolling some paper by that. And as this oscillates back and forth, and this is scrolling to this side, what it's doing is drawing out where the object was located at its position x as a function of t. And as we can see, it looks like a sine or a cosine function. Now, uh, you're going to say, yeah, but this is a cosine function because it's starting right at full amplitude. And then after one-fourth of a cycle, it's at zero. One-half of a cycle, it's at full amplitude in the opposite direction. And then at three-fourths of a cycle, it's passing back through zero. And then at a full cycle, it's right back where it started. And then it continues. So right up and through here represents one, one complete cycle stops here. And then every additional cycle looks the very same. If you've seen one cycle, you've seen them all uh, with uh, these particular systems where the amplitude is staying the same. All right. So again, the frequency will depend how stiff is the spring, how much mass do we have. So think about that. They, and, and I think you'll think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. If something's really stiff, it tends to oscillate rapidly. If it's not very stiff, it's kind of floppy, right? Um, and then with the mass, adding more mass just uh, slows down the process, so the period will get stretched out. Um, we've already talked about this, so uh, getting a velocity is taking the first time derivative. Now, they've got this phase constant uh, in their solution. We haven't included that yet. Um, so what the phase constant is keeping track of, here is the velocity as a function of time. Uh, when we take the derivative, the phase constant stays there. And so that will show up in the velocity and the acceleration. Now here what they've done is, instead of a cosine, to me it looks like they're using a sine function here, right? Because they're starting the clock uh, when we're passing the equilibrium point. So that would indicate that, eh, let's use a sine this time. A sine function would make it easy uh, if this is the case. Now, what happens is if you're in the middle of uh, these oscillations, if you're not at the equilibrium and you're not at full amplitude, what should I use, right? If we start at equilibrium, let's use a sine function. If we start at full amplitude, let's use a cosine function. If it's somewhere in between, that's when the phase constant comes in. So the phase constant tells us uh, by how much difference is there uh, between the starting point here at the top, where we would use a cosine function, 
and uh, where we actually set t equals zero. So in this case, the difference in time is, uh, well, it's a phase constant divided by omega, and then that goes into the formula as plus phi. You guys have played around with functions, right, where um, you can take a function. How do I move the function to the right or move the function to the left? And uh, we can do that by adding a constant in that represents a certain amount of, um, of shift in that function. And that's what the uh, phase constant is keeping track of. Now, all the formulas that we're working with are in terms of omega. Omega has units of radians per second. We've, we've seen this before um, with our angular velocities and our angular, um, well, with our angular velocities, I guess, and with our rotational velocities. Uh, omega is related to a cycle's frequency by a factor of 2 pi. And so uh, omega can be written as 2 pi times f. Uh, that's equal to k over m square root. Uh, so that says that the frequency then could be determined as 1 over 2 pi times k over m. Uh, the period, which is the inverse, the period is the inverse of the frequency. So everything just, we just flip everything over. So um, I learned at one point, I don't know if this, this really works, uh, I frequently pick up my two pies. Uh, imagine dropping your two pies, you know, you're carrying your two pies along and then you drop them. So you have to frequently pick up your two. Why, why is that really? I don't, I don't know why that periodically pick up. Oh, I frequently drop my two pies. That's what the saying is. Sorry. Let me get this right. So I frequently drop my two pies. Here I am with my two pies. Oh, whoops. I dropped my two pies. Uh, and so I frequently drop my two pies, but I periodically pick them up. I don't know. Anyway, uh, don't, don't use that uh, saying. Just remember where the units are here. Uh, the two pi that we have here is two pi radians per cycle. F is in cycles, omega is in radians. I need a conversion factor. The conversion factor is 2 pi. All right, oh no, it's the car springs again. So now we determine those values about the car springs. <coughs> now what we want to do is set it into oscillations. And so we're going to go back with 1,400 kilograms for the mass. So when it goes into oscillations, uh, we have to consider um, we have to consider the mass of the car and the passengers. Now, they rounded a bit more. We rounded at 65,300, I think. They rounded all the way to 65,000. Uh, let's see what the frequencies are for these oscillations. So here's the car going down the highway. It hits a bump and begins to oscillate. But that's complicated because there's springs at each, at each wheel. So what we're going to do is combine all those springs into one effective spring. Here is the mass at what rate will this thing oscillate, and there's our formula. Omega, that's uh, kind of our go-to here, is omega is equal to k over m square root. Now, if the k value is 65,000 newtons per meter, and uh, the mass is 1,400 kilograms, and we square root that, I'm getting 6.81 radians per second. Now, what we want to practice here is, okay, uh, the formulas, when we're deriving them, are always going to be in terms of omega. But there's often that we want to calculate cycles or period. In fact, I always, you know, on midterms, I always ask to solve for, you know, all three of these. Um, they're all related. Think about these as you're doing the problems. Uh, so I can get omega by dividing through by, two, or I can get frequency, rather, f, by dividing through by the radiance frequency. Divide that by 2 pi. That gives me 1.08 cycles per second. Now, if I'm completing a little more than one cycle per second. So I've got oscillations, maybe something like this, right? One, two. So the thing's oscillating like this. How long is each cycle? And so to get the period, I can take one over the frequency. That says each cycle lasts 0.922 seconds. Okay, so a good example in keeping track of omegas, Fs, and Ts, periods and frequencies. Okay, here's kind of that same picture that we started with, and I, I think this is a good one to keep, you know, whenever you kind of get lost in a problem, go back to the kinematics. Uh, and this is telling us 
This is what displacement looks like as a function of x. It's going from amplitude in one direction to full amplitude in the other, oscillating through the cycle. Now, in this example, what have we used? Have we used a cosine or a sine? Which should we use to keep life as simple as possible? And for displacement, it looks like cosine works. So this is going to be a cosine omega t. Now, what are we going to use for velocities and accelerations? Well, we're going to go between what we call v max and negative v max. So v max in the two different directions. And if I start out with something at full amplitude, what it's going to start off with is heading back towards equilibrium. Now that mathematically would be in what we would consider the negative direction. And so when I take a derivative of the cosine, it gives me a negative sign. So here is that first derivative, and that's going to give me a factor of omega out front with the factor of a still there. The cosine becomes a sine, and we have omega t plus that phase constant. Uh, if we take a second derivative to get the acceleration, we bring out another factor of omega, so you guys remember all your rules for taking derivatives, right, with sines and cosines, because we're, we're using them a lot here. Uh, that minus sign stays there, and now it's a cosine. And so that's what the graphs look like. And yeah, you could be asked to uh, do this on a midterm to uh, show graphs of the displacement, velocity, and acceleration um, as a function of time. And so you can see how that behaves. Uh, the acceleration or the displacement starts out at A. Uh, initially, the velocities are going to be in the negative direction. As we pass through that first e the equilibrium uh, point, the uh, x value is 0, but that's where the, the velocity is its maximum value. And it's in the negative direction. Now, the, ac uh, the acceleration is in the direction of the force. And so that's opposite uh, the displacement. So. Um, Take a look at that, stare at those. I've highlighted what, can, what one unit cycle looks like. So if I, you know, drawing all of these, some number of cycles can be confusing. Just stare at one unit cycle and then just say, hey, they all look like that. It's just going to be repeating that one cycle that I've drawn down. That's just going to get repeated over and over. All right, here's an example. We've got a vibrating floor. It's got a large motor. The whole floor vibrates. Uh, a large motor in a factory causes the floor to uh, oscillate. This makes me think of those flasks in those biotech labs uh, where they're stirring them by you know, shifting the uh, flasks back and forth. It says, ooh, the frequency is 10 hertz. So this is pretty rapid, right? This is cycling. I can't cycle that fast. Uh, that's, this is 10 times a second. So 10 hertz, hertz is the same as cycles per second. So it's going to oscillate complete cycles, 10 complete cycles every second. And uh, the amplitude's about 3 millimeters. So this is going to be noticeable. I want to stand on this floor and uh, experience this uh, vibrating floor. Uh, what's the largest value of acceleration that we would have? I'm going to go back to this. What's the largest value of velocity we can have? What is this V max? And it's given by omega times A. It's the coefficients out in front of the sine or the cosine for the velocity function. So omega A will tell us the largest possible value of velocity. Uh, the largest value for acceleration is going to be omega squared times A. So if the omega is pretty large, we can have some pretty significant uh, velocities and accelerations. Let's take a look at this. So again, I've written down these three functions. I've used cosine this time, so this matches the diagram from the previous page. And then I'm looking at the stuff out front. I put the minus sign in with the sign to kind of keep that out of the way, because it's the cosine that turns into the negative sign that turns into the negative cosine. And I've just left the uh, coefficients out front with, you know, with no minus signs there. So say the largest value of x is a, largest value of v is going to be omega a, largest value of a is omega squared times a. So a in this, they said, was 3 millimeters. Frequency is 10 hertz. Now, I want to get that in terms of omegas. And so I'm going to multiply by a factor of 2 pi. That's giving me 62.8 uh, radians per second. So with the omega figured out, then x, here I'm just plugging in what they gave me, 
or, or just writing down what they gave me, 3.0. Uh, the highest velocity, though, is that's 188 millimeters per second. So that's like, you know, 18.8 centimeters. It's like going that far every second because it's going back and forth. It's only going back and forth three millimeters, but it's doing that uh, cycle ten times every second. So that begins to uh, add up. And so this is in millimeters per second, and then multiplying by omega again, that's 11,840 millimeters per second. That's a lot uh, of uh, acceleration. When I put that in meters per second squared, it's 11.8 meters per second squared. That's a pretty good acceleration uh, that this uh, floor is undergoing. You know, hopefully the floor is sturdy so it doesn't get shaken apart. Um, but 11.8 meters per second. So we'll see this. We'll see this in examples where if the omegas are pretty good sized, you know, if we've got pretty good sized frequencies, then the velocities and accelerations can be pretty large. Here is a speaker system. So uh, in a speaker system, we're using... Uh, uh, a current, an electric current, to uh, create a, an electric, uh, an electromagnet uh, that pulls the speaker diaphragm back and forth. Uh, they're saying that if we look at the center of this uh, diaphragm of this speaker, uh, the amplitude at the center of the cone, uh, so this is the cone oscillating back and forth, they're saying that the uh, amplitude is only a tiny fraction of a meter. It's, it's, it's like 0.15 millimeters. So this uh, diaphragm, or this cone on the speaker, is moving back and forth just a little bit, just a little tiny bit. But what's happening is the frequency, this is sound that we're generating, and sound, you know, this is middle C, it says, uh, is the pitch. And so that's going to be 262 cycles per second. Um, what equation will describe the motion of uh, not just the cone, but any point on the diagram? could be described as, um, as a simple harmonic motion, is what we're going to imagine. Uh, what are the velocity and acceleration functions? Yeah, this, this sounds like we've, we've been doing this, so this is just a follow-up to reinforce what we've been talking about. Uh, the amplitude of vibration at that center point, that's probably where the amplitude is the largest, 0.15 millimeters. Uh, at t equals zero, we're going to say x is equal to a, did they tell us that? Did I put that in? Yeah, they told us that. i got to start reading these problems more carefully. And so at t equals zero, we're going to say that it starts out at its, its large, largest displacement, its amplitude. So that means we use cosine. So uh, for this, there's my unit cycle. That's one cycle. And from here to here represents one cycle. And we're starting off at a full displacement, amplitude. So I'm going to use A times cosine. And I don't need the phase constant. I don't need any kind of an additional phase. I'm starting right at the top of the cosine. So the velocity then is given by the negative sign, the, amp, the uh, acceleration, the negative cosine. And I'm just plugging numbers in. Now the frequency here was 262. That means I've got to get the omega calculated, multiplying by 2 pi. That's 1,646 radians per second. And uh, so the period, I can't help just calculating all these, so the period is 1 over f. That worked out to be 3.8 milliseconds. That's not a meter second, that's a millisecond. Where milla, is, it's like millimeter. It's 10 to the minus 3. So uh, these oscillations are happening in milliseconds, and that's what happens with sound. Sound that's audible um, is in the hundreds of cycles per second or thousands, hundreds or thousands. I guess it goes down into the tens, too. We'll get to that chapter. That's actually chapter 16. That's the very last week of the course, uh, looking at sound. Um, and we're still going to be using this mathematics when we get there. So it's just a couple chapters ahead of us. Um, so plugging the numbers in, uh, the displacement, the amplitude, the largest displacements are a fraction of a millimeter. But the largest velocities are 24.7 centimeters per second. And look at the accelerations. The acceleration is 400 meters per second squared. Now, it's not much mass, so it's pretty easy to oscillate back and forth. But this material does have to be durable enough that it can undergo those vibrations and it's, it's not going to tear. It's not going to fail. Because it's a speaker system, right? 
it's my thousand dollar speaker and I don't want it to uh, eh, hundred dollar speaker and I don't want it to uh, fracture okay so um, we've got let's see what did they ask us they wanted us to write down a function so that's we could do that and yeah these are all good questions let me say these are all the questions I'm going to be asking uh, on midterms and such uh, what's the displacement function? What's the velocity function look like? What's the acceleration function? Now, sometimes what, what happens is people put numbers in here. I, I think that's just confusing. So I would leave this as an algebraic expression and then write the numbers down somewhere else. So uh, the, the formula telling me what, for example, the velocity is as a function of time is this where omega is 1,646, so write this next to it. Omega equals this, amplitude equals that. And so just write those numbers to the side. Uh, once you start putting numbers in here, then you kind of lose what those numbers mean necessarily. I think it's better to see the omegas and to see the amplitudes written out explicitly. Um, Oh yeah, and so uh, also what I added on here is where would, uh, here is my time scale, that's one period, where is one millisecond? And what we know is that the entire cycle takes 3.82 seconds. I like drawing graphs too, you guys know that too. So draw the graphs, practice drawing the graphs, and thinking about the horizontal axis, what units are there, uh, how would I scale this? So one, you know, one millisecond is going to be like here, there's one two, three, and then four is just beyond because this cycle took 3.82 seconds. So, so roughly, um, approximately four milliseconds, one, two, three, four, but specifically 3.82. And then what we can also do is they're going to ask us at a particular instant. Okay, so when, when we're asking where is it at one millisecond, one millisecond should put us just beyond equilibrium. Uh, remember, the entire cycle takes 3.82. If I divide that into fourths, that would be 1.9, 0 0.95. It's going to be like 0.95 seconds, something like that, to get to here. One millisecond would put us, I'm guessing we're right there at one millisecond. So let's try that. What they want us to do is take those formulas and say at one millisecond, I put the millisecond in here, what is x equal to? Well, if I put in omega t, there's my omega, there is the t that I'm interested in. That combined, the seconds cancel out, gives me 1.646 radians. I am 1.646 radians into this cycle. We could count how many, how many, um, what fraction of a period that is. We haven't done that, but we could. Uh, and then cosine of omega t, I'm breaking this down into steps, becomes 0 0.0751. That is now unitless. And then x is equal to a times the cosine. And that says that we are at minus 0 0.0113 millimeters. So yeah, we're just slightly negative in terms of displacement. We are very close to our highest velocity, but the uh, acceleration is going to be relatively small. If you go back and look, <clears throat> what was the largest displacement? 0.15 millimeters. Uh, the largest speed? 24.7 centimeters per second. And the largest acceleration? 406. So, uh, as we guessed, we are nowhere near you know, we're at a fraction of the displacement maximum, but we're, we're pretty much almost right at the highest velocity. Uh, as far as acceleration, we're at a pretty low fraction of the acceleration, is how it's all working. Ooh, this is a long problem. <laughs> What's up? Let's read through this. Why did they do this? Um, okay, a spring stretches, that looks like 15 centimeters, when a 300 gram object, a 300 gram mass, is gently attached. The spring is then set up horizontally 
resting on a frictionless table. You know what this sounds like? It sounds like that first example we started off with. Uh, I'm going to come back and read carefully as needed. I know that's not a good, not a good strategy, but I do want to get the diagram written uh, down. So here's the diagram. It's horizontal. This surface is frictionless. Here's equilibrium. Here is minus A, plus A. Those are my amplitudes. Uh, here is the spring constant. It's an ideal spring. It's going to oscillate back and forth. That's the vertical example. So the vertical example would be, uh, here is a vertical spring. It stretches by X naught. Oh, this is what they did. Okay, I re I'm remembering this problem. We're going to have to go back and read it carefully. We first of all took a vertical spring and then attached a mass and carefully brought it to equilibrium. That's what they should have said. They shouldn't have said we gently, what was it they said? Gently attached. Don't say gently attached. Say we attached the object and carefully brought it to equilibrium uh, so that it's at rest. Saying it's, we gently attached it doesn't really help. It could still go into oscillations, right? So we carefully brought it to equilibrium and we used uh, the equilibrium forces to determine what the K value is. So first of all, we did this set. This could be lab, right? We could be doing this in lab. Uh, we determined the K value to be 19.6 newtons per meter. So now that we know what the K value is from doing this particular setup, this particular set of exercises, now we're going to take that very same spring that has that value and we're going to attach the very same 300 kilogram object. We're going to set them up on a horizontal frictionless surface and we're going to give it an initial amplitude of 10 centimeters. Boy, I hope I read that right. Let me go back and see. Um, the mass is, is, is pushed so that the spring is now compressed. I guess I could have used plus 10 or minus 10. I, I, I chose to call that plus. Um, so these numbers could be, they could have signs reversed. Uh, I chose, yeah, it said compressed. So uh, let's, let's not compress it. Let's pull it out this direction. 10 centimeters. I mean, we could just switch the coordinate system and call these direction positive x and this negative x, but I'm just going to say let's pull this out to here, 10 centimeters, and then let go, and it should go into oscillations. Uh, what will be the frequency of these oscillations? The frequencies, by taking k and dividing by m and taking a square root. Now, there is a decimal here. I, I, that's not very legible. Uh, it's 8 point, it's not 8,000, it's not a comma, it's a decimal. And so 8.08 .08 radians per second. Now you can see with these radians I'm a little nervous uh, about losing precision with them. I, I put in an extra sig fig. Um, but now what we can do, once we've got the omegas figured out, we can calculate the Vmax. So we've got the frequencies figured out, the Vmax is given by omega times A, I'm getting the units on all these, so the omega radians per second, uh, the amplitude is seconds. Remember, radians are unitless. Radians are just placeholders. And so I no longer need the radians, I drop those, and now I'm at 80.8 centimeters per second. Uh, the acceleration just requires an extra factor of omega. So carrying out that calculation, I ended up with 653 centimeters, and I converted that into meters. I could have left it as centimeters. If the numbers get huge, you should convert as needed uh, to make your answer, you know, the, to communicate your answer the most effective uh, way you can. And uh, so this is, an this, this is an example of uh, how a lot of these problems look in the homework and on the midterm. Uh, a, B. C, D, E, F, G. Is there an H? Nope, stopped at G. So um, E is asking about frequency, and I can get that by taking omega, dividing through by frequently dropping my two pi's. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, 1.29 cycles per second. That's not a comma, that's, that's, a, that's a decimal too. That decimal over there looks better, the one with the hertz. Hertz and cycles per second are the same thing. Uh, and then the period is 1 over F. Uh, and that came in at 0.777 seconds. And then they said, 
uh, where will this be located at a time of 0.15 seconds? So I put 1.5 seconds into that formula along with the omegas. So I put in the t's, I put in the omegas, I followed those formulas, and I found that it's located at 3.51 at 0.15 seconds. Now I'm always curious, how many cycles is this? Uh, I didn't draw the oscillation, but I, I do have the period. So notice, I've got the period right here. To me, that's very useful to think about. So the entire cycle requires 0.777 seconds. So roughly, that's like 0.8 seconds, 8 tenths of a second, the whole cycle. Each portion of the cycle is going to take 0.2. And so where would we expect to be at 0.15? We would expect to still be in the first one-fourth of the cycle. Do we have a good diagram on that? Mm. Sort of. Okay, so we would expect if this is the full cycle, and this is taking 0.777, then this is roughly 0.2. We're only at 0.15. So 0.15 is going to put us somewhere like this. Now in the example that we're looking at, that was 10 centimeters. And so we have dropped down to 3.5 centimeters. Now notice we're going in the negative direction. And that says at that very same time, we're going to have a pretty good sized velocity and it's going to be in the negative direction. So come back to those graphs. Play around with those. Come back with those every problem. See if you can identify where you are on the graph. Because uh, that's, that's what we've done here. And so, is this the example? This was the speaker. Here we go. Yeah, the speaker was a good example for this too. Uh, and so at 0.15, we're going really fast, so uh, almost at uh, Vmax, and we're going in the negative direction, and the displacement has reduced by, yeah, that seems perfectly sensible. So you can do the, the calculations, and then you can look at your graphs and see if you can match them up. If they, if they don't make sense, maybe something's wrong, either with the graph or with the uh, calculations that you've done. Okay, here is another example. Uh, this is probably, I think we're, we're going to be finishing up here for the day, right? Because uh, we're just about where we want to be. Maybe I'll get this started a bit. Um, here we have another spring. We're going to start with a push. These are starting to sound familiar. In fact, it, it is a follow-up with the previous example. So let's take a couple minutes and at least... Uh, see if we can get through this one. Uh, it's the very same uh, spring, 8.083 radians per second. Now, they've already dropped the radians. I think you need to have the radians in there. The radians need to be in there to let your reader know that you're in radians and not in cycles. So definitely make sure you get the radians in. Now, see, they're using negative 10. I used positive 10. Um, not a big problem, not a big, a big deal, but um, now this time, instead of releasing from rest, they're going to give it a shove to give it an extra starting speed back towards equilibrium, and that's going to be at 40 uh, centimeters per second. So this is, um, actually this is going to be more involved, so let's see what it looks like. So here is the object at equilibrium. Uh, but it's actually oscillating back and forth. Now, there's going to be an amplitude out here for the oscillations, and um, this amplitude is not going to be the 10 centimeters. So what's happened in this problem is that we gave it a push. So we gave it a little bit of a boost to get it started. And what that's going to mean is that since it's already starting at some speed, it's going to overshoot uh, the 10 centimeter mark. So, i got to go back the right direction here. So what's going to happen in this case is, let's say we started right here. This is the 10 centimeters, or the negative 10 centimeters. I'm starting right there. Now, I, if I just let go, it would oscillate between plus and minus 10. But since I gave it a push, 
it's going to overshoot the 10 mark and it's going to oscillate out more broadly. So giving it not just an initial displacement, but also giving it an initial velocity means that it's going to overshoot the, the original 10 centimeters and the amplitude is going to be larger. Now the way we can take care of that, let's go back to our formulas of x as a function of t, v as a function of t. Those are the formulas we've been working from. Now this time we're going to put the phase angle back in uh, because we're not starting at the full amplitude. We're starting at something less than full amplitude. So it's not going to be just a simple cosine omega t. I've got to put an extra phase constant in to represent uh, where we were in the phase when we started. Now if I put t equals zero, so if these are the general formulas, what we're going to do, you should write down onto this, I didn't write this, you should write this as t at t equals zero. So at t equals zero, well if I put zero in for t, x is going to be equal to, x naught is a cosine of the phase angle, or the phase constant, and uh, V naught is minus omega A times the sine of that uh, phase. Okay, so I am going to stop there. So, um, and we'll come back and we'll just pick up with this problem. So let's do that. If you guys have questions on anything, stop by office hours, let me know.